Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to a new week. And we're continuing these studies on the book of Judges, chapter 13. Let us uh, seek the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for all that you do. Um, we're thankful for the blessings of this past Sabbath and the way that you work upon our hearts. We ask for forgiveness for our words and actions that have not represented you all right. We ask, Lord, that we can change the aspects of our character with your help, that we can see clearly our need and that we can cling to you and that your character can shine through. We ask, Lord, that as we continue to look at these lines, especially in connection with uh, Samson, um, we know, Lord, that this is a message to us directly, and we need your help. Be with us now, we pray and ask, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. Now, uh, it's going to be a bit shorter study because we started a bit late today, but um, we were putting on the board on Thursday these um, the first part, the first 12 verses of Judges chapter 13. And what we are addressing is this idea that Judges 13 represents a chiasm. And so we're examining that. Now, we do have uh, 13, 13 as the center of this chiasm. So that's the center verse of these 25 verses. And um, there's, there's a bunch of things, you know, that I've been studying and trying to understand that I don't think I can yet bring into this study. Um, but uh, uh, the number 13 we know is the number of rebellion. And when we look at the story of Samson, we know that it's an ironic story. Um, and but it's a story that represents this movement. Now, if we are to look at this movement as a line of rebellion, that that's something quite different than what we think of as a reform line. But is this movement? Does do we have to address rebellion that exists within each one of us? When it comes to these lines, is this line, are these lines not representing the rebellion, not just within the church and not with, just within the movement itself, but the rebellion that exists within inside of us, each one of us? If, if we look at the story of Samson and we see that it represents uh, how God can use sinful human beings to his glory then it gives us a much better appreciation of what we are in the context of, of the gospel, because we are sinners who are redeemed. God isn't saving those that are worthy of saving. He's saving the unworthy. He's calling those that are cast out, the poor, right? Those that have, have nothing to offer. And until we realize we have nothing to offer, um, God cannot really use us. So, so there's lots of things regarding this um, uh, that we need to understand. So I, I'm just going to share something with you here before we uh, go. So I did send this to Iran, and, and I sent it to Stephen as well. If I can find it again. Uh, I know where it is, but... Uh, here it is. Okay, so now I haven't done a great deal of uh, delving into this, but a 364-day calendar. Does anybody know where this comes from? Well, it should be obvious here if you look at this. What is a 364-day calendar? You said 360. You said 364. 364 days. So we know of a 360-day calendar. We know a 365 and a quarter, right? And yeah. But 364, so what is 364? We dealt with it before when we were dealing with measures. Mm 
people uh, number of days number of days in 52 weeks right right so so this this calendar occurs in uh the book of enoch right so this was a calendar because i've been doing this paper on uh, uh the care rights and uh you know dealing with the the Feast of First Fruits and, and so forth. So I'm right now working on a section dealing with the Karaites and their calendar and why it couldn't be used uh, by the Millerites to, to give October 22nd, 1844. It doesn't actually produce that date, uh, no matter how you slice it. And um, um, so in studying the Karaites, the Karaites uh, and the Essenes and the rabbins, the, the rabbis, the rabbinic Jews, they all had different calendars. And the Essenes had a 364-day calendar. Now, it, I'm sorry, it, that the who the Essenes? The Essenes, the ones you know where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those were uh, writings of the Essenes that were. Yeah, yeah, I, I know who it is. I just didn't. Know that's, the the, well. that's the major theory of who just, who stored the Dead Sea Scrolls because there's definitely writings there from the Essenes. But anyway, this um, uh, this is. 1260d.com um, this guy actually produces uh this oops this calendar that i use sometimes this is his he has the 360 day calendar and when you click on the link to the enoch calendar that's where you get to whoops you get to this page right <clears throat> now what he says here is um it's the calendar of reconciliation because it reconciles seven, the number of perfection, and 13, the number of rebellion and failure. Seven times 13 equals 91. And this reconciliation is universal, which is what 4, 4 40, 400 symbolizes as in the four corners of the earth. So four times 13 times seven equals 364. Now, do we remember how we uh, took this number and produced the symbol for July 18, 2020. So if you take 364 and you multiply it by the number of minutes, it's uh, 524,160. I didn't understand that. Okay. You did so in 364 days, there is um, 524,160 minutes. In 364 days? Yeah. Okay. Right. And that is, that is um, if you divide it by 28, it's um, 18720. Okay. So... So, so this number, this number of July 18, 2020 is connected with this 364 day calendar. And we had done this, we had figured out this number in connection with uh, the number of grains in, in a particular uh, measure. I, I think I remember this. Yeah. So, so I'd noted it before and that it, it represented 364 days. So we had this number and then I found that if I, uh, you know, looked at the number th that we have one eight seven two zero, that it connected to this um, three hundred and sixty four day calendar. So I've known about the three hundred and sixty four day calendar. The point here is that this is the calendar of reconciliation. That it's reconciling the symbol of re rebellion and the symbol of perfection. And and if we think about it, I mean, that's what the cross does, right? Christ became a curse for us in the midst of a week, right? Now, in 31 AD, but we can see that 13 and 31 are complementary symbols. We've already seen that in other lines, right? And if you, you know, multiply 31 by 7, you get uh, 21, 7, right? Which is, um, you know, half of the... Um, the the 62 weeks right because 31 weeks times seven is half of the 62 weeks and that creates a chiasm right so this was noticed back you know in 2000 
2015 or something like that, dealing with that number, probably actually 2014. So um, when, when we're looking at Samson, then this story of Samson, what we're looking at is in, in this first part, this, this chiasm, we have this symbol of 1313 as the center of these verses that are leading up to the birth of Samson. Now, um, now Samson is a type of Christ, correct? That was something we established before. Correct. Okay, which, which seems fairly odd, right? But it's, it's emphasizing more the humanity of Christ rather than his divinity. I mean, he's going to be this child. You know, we have very similar language that are given in regard to the birth of Christ. Um, he's a Nazarite, right? So all these, these, and there's more than, than that, but people have noticed this connection between Samson and Christ, and yet, you know, Samson's in some ways a negative figure. We also see this with, with Manasseh. Really, actually, the same type of language that's used for Samson is used for the birth of Manasseh in Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, the people usually just directly refer to the birth of Christ. But if you look in the context, it's talking about the birth of Manasseh, one of the kings that's going to be, um, uh, the land is going to be forsaken of, right? So he's going to be converted. You know, butter and honey shall he eat till he know to choose the good and refuse the evil. So, so Manasseh, as one of the sons of David, of course, he's going to typify Christ. But he typifies Christ in his his conversion, in the sense that he he um, he represents that victory over our human nature. Now, Samson is sort of depicting the weakness of human nature. In, and and this would be in contrast to Christ, who actually shows the power of divinity over the weakness of human nature. So this reconciliation of, of rebellion, which, which we are in, and, and God's perfection, I mean, this is the cross, and the very center of a cross, or the very center of a chiasm is a cross, right? So, so we can understand those principles. But that's not too abstract for anyone. People understand what we're talking about here. I think you're pretty familiar with some of these ideas. Yes. Okay. Now, so right now we're, we're studying, trying to understand Judges 13, what, what, it's, what it's meaning. So um, the suggestion was that this is a chiasm, and it does have aspects of a literary chiasm. But it's not what, what I call a perfect chiasm in the sense that, you know, you can easily just take a verse at the beginning, a verse at the end, and you can see how they clearly match up. Like you would if you went through the Song of Solomon. You can easily see the chiasm. And, and the story of Noah and the flood, you can easily see the chiasm. It's been laid out by many, many people. I don't know of anybody, and I couldn't find anybody, who had done a chiasm of Judges chapter 13. Um, uh but we're gonna we're now so I need to get the whiteboard behind me going. Um, so, so when we do this, we have the stuff that we wrote down. on the board on Thursday. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the rest of these verses um, and try to see how we can connect them uh, to this. Now, any any final thoughts before we go into the whiteboard here? Yeah, I, I, I just want to remind myself or get reminded that's S-B-O, that's, that's subject, verb, and what's the other one? Object. Object. Okay. Right. I mean, generally you break down a sentence into subject, verb, and object. Because if it's a sentence, you have to have a subject, you have to have a verb, you have to have an object in English. Right. Um, right. Because somebody's going to do something and there's going to be the subject who, who acts 
and and then there's going to be the object that's being acted against in some way. I have always put a uh, sentence together as like who, what, where, when, why. Okay. Well, that's a news that, story. That, that's that's just me. Um, but I, I like this subject, verb, and object. Yeah. So, you know, like Johnny hit Rachel. I mean, right. The subject, the verb, the action is hit, and Rachel's the object, right? So, right. you know, the sentences generally go in that sense. But you know, we're not we're not really doing great English here in how we're choosing the subject and the object. It's basically we're just looking at the nouns and the verbs, the actions. And then we're going to try to find the parallels as we as we go through the rest of these verses. Um, and some of them are are connected in uh, in different ways. So uh, I don't think you know I don't know if I would have without our understanding the message actually seen this as a literary chiasm, but I think it does represent this. Um, and at least in the very number of the verses, thirteen thirteen creates a chiasm of this chapter, right? So just even in that sense. So you're yeah, we, as long as we take the symbology and the account, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I just um, changed the mic over. I think it tends to work better when I have that mic uh, on. Okay, so um, when we look at, at vor verse 14, so we had verse 13 as the center. We didn't really write it here, but we had verse 13 as the center. And then we're going to have verse 14. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So this, this is a repetition. Now, remember, we had these instructions of of this referring to the child right that there you're going to have this son that's mentioned um but when we have these instructions these instructions are about the woman right so they're not about the child per se i mean they are because of the nazarite vow so what do these instructions regarding the woman that she may not have anything that cometh of the vine. Why do we have this instructions in regard to the woman? Who is the woman then? Because we've talked about this. Um, and why these instructions to her? She's going to be the main one who, who of course, bears the child and will teach the child God's word. So her okay. lifestyle has to measure up to what she's teaching. Okay. Uh, didn't we refer to her as the church? Okay. So a woman represents the church, a wife, right? Mm -hmm. Now, now in trying to address that, you know, we would say, well, is this the Adventist church? You know, is this somehow the movement in some way? Um, so, so what did we conclude or what, how, how can we address that again? I thought we had uh, semi concluded that it was uh, addressed to the movement. Okay, so it addresses the movement. Now we know that Manoa is a message, right? Correct. Okay, and that's the message that we connect with the message of rest, which represents both the twenty five twenty and and other things, but but also of course the gospel. Right. And it means from rest. So so we know that this is a message that ha that comes from that has the background. Right. It comes from somewhere. It comes from rest. And, and we could also see that there is a connection with uh, FFA itself. Right. Um, can't remember the name of the place, but. Um, we could connect this with that this this is a message that comes uh, from the movement, but it's a message for the movement. Yeah, we had uh, seen the me men men on the front. Yeah, the men, and that that produced the from. Yeah, 
So it's a letter mem, but it, it's pronounced mim uh, when it's used to mean from, right? So, so it's from, from rest. And he was from some other place. I can't remember the name of the place, but uh, um, what was, where was it? Zor or something like that. Yeah. What was the name of the place? Just somebody look it up. What did it mean? Zora. And then 13. She's Louise here. Is thirteen. Um, it means uh, it means. I'm sorry. Properly, a part of of four four eight two. Okay. Just what words does it give? Um. Above, after, among, at, because of, okay. by, reason of, from. No, that's, that's not right. Okay, I'll do it here. You, you're not doing it correctly. <laughs> Somehow. So, um, um, so which verse is that? It is thirteen two. Okay, it's thirteen two. Yeah, Zora, right? Yeah. Um, oh, I see another right. one. Apparently from. Okay. Yeah, so you're looking at the wrong word. You're looking at because it has a from in front of it. You're looking at the mim. Okay. <laughs> what, uh, okay, so then there's the word behind it. Right. Apparently that's another so, form of 6880. It hornet. It was a hornet, right? That was it, a hornet. Okay. So that was the connection. I I, I knew there was the connection to FFA because FFA is on Bumblebee Road. Bumblebee Road. Okay, so there we go. So we have this connection. Okay. So so this would represent like the school of the prophets more specifically even than FFA. I think that's what we agreed. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but I'm just I'm just referring to that again just so that we can uh, keep it in so, mind. Yeah, so we have this woman but we have this person that's from the school of the prophets, not that it's a person, it's a message that comes from there. And, and whatever that particularly means, we know that this is about um, this movement. Like that's how we're taking, we're making an application. It doesn't mean there isn't a larger application, but this is the application that we're taking because of what's been shown us. And we can see how it relates presently to us. So if this movement, we have this woman, this woman would represent uh, specifically what? If we have Manoah, which is this message that comes from the school of the prophets, but he has this wife, I mean, this wife must represent not just a message, but somehow a church. FFA. Well, yeah, maybe FFA, but maybe even something broader than that. But not not necessarily the Seventh Day Adventist Church as an organization, right? But it, it could represent the people in the church, right? The people who are in this movement more as individuals, because the counsel is given to them, to those that are studying God's word. So we could be uh, the bride. The bride, you know, so to speak, of the lamb's wife, however we want to look at it, those that are seeking to be married to Christ. Yeah, that sounds okay. that sounds compatible. Okay, so because that's who the directions are given to to the woman, but there is this message, and Manoah is a message that is seeking right. to understand directions that are to be given that Manoah is this this message to the woman right it mean it becomes this 
uh, conduit for this message to the woman. Right? So, so yeah, God has yeah. given us a message. And, and specifically, I believe that this relates to not just the 2520, but everything that encompasses the chronology in how this, and, and, and I know not everybody you know, fully understands how this message of chronology and what it means and how it came to this movement, um, because it came as a result of an analytical um, uh, work in understanding uh, the prophecies of Adventism, how the 2520 was connected to uh, what we understand about the prophetic periods, right? So we ended up with this, this tool. Now, when Parminder had made his time prediction regarding 2014, um, there's a part of that that people don't realize that that is correct. That is, Parminder was expecting the Sunday law. But there wasn't really a good reason to expect the Sunday law based on what he had found, right? Remember, he had taken the mini, mini Tegel Farson, and, and we had already applied this as 126 years from 1863 to 1989. And he took it from 1888, where he marks a Sunday law. Um, but we know that really uh, the Sunday law is marked in... Uh, 1892 by by Jones, right? Because that's where Jones is going to have the mighty angel of Revelation um, 18 come down. This is in 1892. I think I said it right the first time, but maybe I said it wrong. But 1892, right? That was Jones. That was Jones, right? And Ellen White endorses that, not not specifically in that, in directly in that way, but she endorses that this work is being done by the message. Um, that's going to be presented in the 1893 General Conference. Uh, that, ver uh, that work of uh, confession and repentance. Um, but it, it's not completed because it, there's a rejection of the first and second angels' messages. And if you can't be benefited, you can't be benefited by the third if you, if you're, if you reject the first and second angels' messages. So... <clears throat> So this movement has been raised up to understand Millerite history. That's the primary purpose of this movement is to understand Millerite history, its repetition and its connection to the Sunday law that's coming. Would we agree with that statement? That sounds uh, acceptable. Okay. Now, now this is a, a very, um, this is a problem in some ways because this mo movement is small and this was noticed I, I think the first time I heard it was actually in 2010 um, in, in Oklahoma, where there was this, just this comment, I think it was Jeff writing on the whiteboard, but it could have been Emiliano mentioning it first. But the idea that, you know, we, we have this problem because in the Millerite reform line, you see this constant growth of the movement. But in our reform line, you actually see a diminishing of the movement, right? It, it, it doesn't continually get bigger and bigger, right? We keep seeing it getting smaller and smaller. And this is even before they had their first, um, you know, division as such, that the move movement became, it, that there was no major groups leaving before that, but lots of individuals had been leaving the movement as it progressed, because as light came to the movement, people didn't want to go in the direction the movement was going. Uh, for instance, in April of 2010, Johannes Koletsky uh, did that paper, which, which was sent to me um, uh, in uh, 2016, the one that's on my academia site, the one dealing with Joseph, where he shows the, the structural chiasms in the story of Joseph and how they connect to the 2520. Uh, the reason, he, and he left the movement shortly after because the, the direction that the movement was going in opposition to the church, he wasn't happy with. Right. So many people were interested in what Jeff was teaching, except as it seemed to go against <clears throat> uh, the church or, or whatever personal beliefs that even people might have had that Jeff didn't agree with. And so the movement kept getting smaller and smaller. And so that, that's always been a problem when we deal with here is God giving a message to a to a few people. 
and and it's not it doesn't seem to be growing you know the movement seems to be getting smaller and smaller um but that is consistent with what what principle is that consistent with um a mirror well no. it's consistent with the mirror but it's consistent with the gospel isn't it that the that the road to life is broad or the road to death is broad and easy and the road to life is straight. And yes. Narrow. Yes. Right. Um, there's so many principles where God has, you know, obviously we see it with Jesus and the disciples. So we see John six, six, six. Um, you know, so we see that this, the God is, uh, we see it in the story of Gideon. I mean, we can see it again and again in scriptures that he uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. Right. So now God is using this movement, but we don't, we don't know particularly what that all means. I mean, it's definitely not something to exalt self. Right. This is not something where we're going to have, and, and that's what Parminder and Tavo wanted was this, you know, this huge movement that was going to uh, call Adventists out of the Adventist church into this new church and all these wonderful and powerful things that would be done. And those to me seem contrary to the principles of Christ. Um, so, so anyway, that's the situation that, that we have regarding this movement, that this, there is this message that is going to be connected with this birth of this type of Christ. But again, it's going to be an ironic type. Right? So that's, that's part of the problem that, that we have in the story of Samson. So when we take this, uh, and, and, uh, and I'm not going to draw the verses like we were, we we're going to draw the verses down here. What I want to do is connect the verses with these things. So where do we see in verse 14, where do we see directions regarding the woman, right? So verse 14, um, if we go back and look at the other verses, the instructions that are given, they're given in which verses? The, which Verse 14 is, is a repetition of which verses? So you need to be looking at Judges. Uh, verse, verse 4 right. and verse 5. Right, so 14 is going to be here. And verse 7. Yeah. Right, is, is that it? 4, 5, and 7? Uh, so, as far as I can see. Okay, anybody else? Dwight? You got any thoughts on this? I, I can't look at the verses right now, so because I'm only looking at a few verses here on my screen, verse 14 to 19. Okay, so we're gonna put that there. So we're gonna say four, five, and seven are connected to verse 14. Okay, now verse 15. Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. So um, now we have the angel of the Lord. Um, in this sense, it's going to be de detained. And he's going to make ready a kid for thee. So this, how, how does this verse relate to the first 12 verses? Can we connect this in any way? This here. All right, so verse 14 is these instructions. Uh, verse, I think verse 8 for 15. Okay, so what's, what's verse 8 say? 
Uh, then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the God, man of God, which thou didst send, come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Okay, so you're you're connecting it in what way? What way are you connecting 15 to? Well, uh, they asked for it, and now oh. they were now they're they're happy they got it, and they're they're going to the uh, offer the. So we're going to make the offering or instruction or in some way, right? Even though it's a different kind of instruction, right? So right. it doesn't say specifically why, um, but, but this obviously he, this, he's detaining him for some reason. He wants to have more information, right? right? As we find out later. And, and they want to know about his name, right? We're going to see all that. Okay, so we got verse 15 is going to connect with verse 8. Verse 16, the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. So we would connect this with which verse? Wouldn't this be with verse 16? Six, let's see. So they don't know of his, she doesn't know his name. Yeah, right? but she said his countenance was very terrible. And it must be an angel of God because of that. Yeah, but they don't know his name. She didn't. He they, didn't tell me where he, where he was from or what his. That's name, right. Right. So here she said neither told me his name. Right. So they do not know his name. They do not know his character. They do not know he's an angel of the Lord. In a sense, they do not know his name. Okay. Would we say that? Yes. And that would be the primary aspect there. I mean, it, it does have the detaining there. So I mean, uh -huh. we could put it. And know. it's also got Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord in, right. in 16. Right. Yeah, that's that's the idea. Right? That's why we connected it to six. Yeah. So I'm going to put 16 here as well. Okay, 17. Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, what is thy name? And when thy sayings come to pass that we may do, that when thy saints come to pass, we may do the honor. So again, he's going to ask of his name. So the seven, the 16, 17, 18 has to do with his name. Yes. So, you know, so they don't know his name. And so 16, 17, and 18 all address his name, right? And his name is going to be as in secret, secret. Right, Palmonai. That's what we determined. Yeah. Now, uh, the verse that we had, uh, verse 8, can you read verse 8? Um, yeah. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Now, so this idea of teaching in in here, I'm going to attach verse 18, Palmoni. Right, whoops, Palmoni. Um, to this teaching, because how are we instructed? Now, and I won't, so we know Palmoni has to do with numbers, but this is also a teacher. Is Palmoni not our teacher? Yes. So. Okay, so Palmoni is our teacher. He's an instruct. We're being instructed by Palmoni, right? The wonderful member. Correct. Member of secrets. Now, I mean, to many pe people, this would be odd. 
But why, why is Christ powerful enough? Why is he using number to instruct us, particularly at this time? I mean, we've discussed this before. Why is there, there all this necessary, all of this necessary? Why is chapter 13 necessary for Samson to be born? Uh, because Samson's a message, isn't he? Okay, he's a message. Um, but he's he also represents Christ. He's a type of Christ, though. In right. So this is about... And, and, it, and it's displaying Christ's human nature, not his divine nature per se. But basically, it's 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 how human nature um, uh, controls. Right? It's his nature that's controlling him. But we know that it's a type of Christ, and so that it's it's meant to illustrate Christ in this ironic sense. But it does represent this movement, right? The message of this movement, the message that is meant to be a message of reconciliation between rebellion and the cross, right? The seven and 13. So, so when we look at Palmoni as a teacher, remember we were studying about this teacher of righteousness according to righteousness, can we say that Palmona here in this story is Christ who represents the number seven or is represented by the number seven, the cross, the, mid, the midst of the week? It, it's, it's definitely highly possible. Right. Okay. And, and then we can see that this, this rebellion that, that we are caught in this, in this world of sin the Christ's remedy of instruction is, is Bible prophecy. The prophecy was given in order to instruct us so that we could overcome sin. That the final generation, because, and the problem that exists is the one of the subjective nature of human beings, right? We can fool ourselves. You know, we had this discussion on Friday afternoon, the study that I did here in the building. Uh, one of the guys at the study, he was a Mormon. He actually became a Christian through Mormonism first before he became a Christian, you know, through regular Christianity. Um, and, of course, with Mormons, it's the burning in the bosom that is the evidence of something being true. Right. So if you feel it's true, it must be true, of course. The human heart is deceptively wicked above all things, right? You know, I mean, to tr trust your feelings, um, that's definitely not from God. So we need something objective. And God gives us Bible prophecy. So Bible prophecy can illustrate for us something in, a, in an objective manner that we can look at, we can measure. That's outside of our normal feelings, outside of human perception. And, and something that can be measured, something that we can have faith in. So we it's can know that, actually scientific. Yeah, in the truest sense of the word. In the truest sense of the word. Science just means knowledge, right? And to know the wisdom of God, right? To know knowledge, we have to know the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord's beginning of wisdom. And, and we can know things because we, in our Friday studies, we could see that we can't actually know the mind of God apart from God instructing us. Because our mind is not subject to the law of God. It's enmity. Right? At, at, it's not at enmity. It is enmity. It is enmity. Right? It's against everything that God is. So... So we are sinners. We can easily deceive ourselves that we are righteous when we're not. And we all do it, right? We have all kinds of means of self-justification in all kinds of situations. And, and we can, in a sense, be justified because we can look at others. And when we look at others' actions, we can easily justify our own in, own in comparison to them, right? Because we can pick out 
the fact that people are indeed sinners and we can ignore the fact that we are. So in order to be like Christ, we obviously can't look at ourselves. Christ changes us. It's his righteousness that's displayed in us. So we can see that in, in this story here, that, that God is showing us something about the message, how this problem of not knowing God's name, right? Because if you don't know God's name, you don't know his character, correct? Uh, we can, we've related it to the names of the prophets uh, reflecting their character. So I would say yes. Yeah, name, a name denotes character, right? That's when what we say. Know, you, you know, the name of the Lord is, is really about his character. He's the self-existent one. All of the titles or names of God are representing his character. And so they don't know his name. They need to come to know his name. So in some ways, when we look at this chiasm, this chiasm, if I was going to characterize a chiasm, right, you would have, you'd have a center here, you'd have a beginning and the end. And, you know, we, we could look at the chiasm of Canaan and Egypt, or uh, Leah and Rachel, or Christ's ministry on earth, Christ's ministry in heaven, or, you know, the 1260s, the one for paganism and papalism, right? The counterfeit of the earthly worship, the counterfeit of the heavenly worship, right? So we could see this here. If we we're going to characterize in this way, this is not knowing the name. And this is knowing the name. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. So in some ways, we can see that there is information in this chiasm that is being given regarding the character and the work of Christ. And this is going to be manifest ultimately in the birth. So, um, you know, if we look at the beginning of this, uh, what what is, we're going to get Samson at the end, right? We would agree with that? Yeah. So he, he represents the deliverer, right? So here we have oppression over here, right? I mean, we could say, you know, the period of the dark is, is oppression. You know, this is Philistine oppression. I should write me here. Right? You got oppression over here. And then you have an arrival of a message. Right? And, and I mean, we know that this, if we're going to take this chiasm, uh, we haven't placed 1313. That is, we know that this is all about 9-11, is it not? Is it not 9-11 that is the arrival of the second angel's message that this, this chapter is characterizing? Yes. So, you know, not that 13-13 represents 9-11 per se directly. It's it's the second angel's message. Is it's the it? warning, what... let the woman, let her beware, right? Right. Right, let her beware. It's that second angel's message. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Okay, so we have here before 9-11, there's something that this movement doesn't know, right? But we do have this message coming, right, from Christ. And now this is all a zoom into 9-11, if we want to look, because this whole chapter characterizes 9-11. But it characterizes what 9-11 accomplishes for this movement as far as knowing something, because 9-11 gives us even though we have 1989, right? So 1989 is the time of the end and so forth. But what does 9-11 give us specifically regarding numbers? I mean, we know that we don't, that there's different ways in which we could characterize when. Well, symbol. we kind of link this stuff to um, uh, Testimonies 9, I think it was, 11. Okay. Yeah, and we also, so. we also connected it to... Um, what was the other one? Uh, 
uh, Revelation 9-11. Um, there was there was more than that though. I, I just those are the only two that I remember. So so 9-11 now becomes this this numeric symbol that we start to connect to two verses. So we don't have much of that prior to 9-11. I mean, obviously it even takes time to get 9-11 to become that symbol per se. I mean, I know that Jeff didn't know about the testimonies 9-11 thing until a bit later, right? So he was making the argument before he even had um, that, that numeric connection with testimonies 9-11. Now, I don't remember when I first heard of testimonies 9-11, it was shortly after 9-11 that somebody pointed this out. We um, also got 9-11 um, was a reverse of the 11, 9, the 11, uh, November 9th. And so that's how we ended up seeing that it was uh, a mirror image. Okay, yeah. So November 9th ended up becoming connected to 9 11. And we, we, we also see... had the first day of the first month. We did. Yeah. Oh, so that, yeah, I know. So it, it brought all kinds of symbols. Yeah, man. There was, there was a lot of 9 11 stuff. <laughs> right. But, but this is what I'm saying, is that if we look at this story of Samson, that it there is a chiasm. The chiasm primarily is not, a, is we don't know God's name, but we don't know the character of God. There's this instruction that's given to the woman, mm. but that instruction continues after 9-11 as well. Right. And we can see that there is, in the first angel's message, is there not the three angels' messages all tied together? Yes. So in here, I would say that this not knowing, if we put 1989 here, right, we can see that in the first angel's message, we have all three. And all three of those messages are pointing to this son that's going to be the, the deliverer, which is Christ. Because these are all instruction to the woman, what she needs to do in order for this son to be born, to be a Nazarite and fulfill his purpose. Now, when we go on like verse 19, this is going to be this offering. So we're going to see this offering in verse 19, 20. Now, if we if we take these now as verse 19, can that represent uh, 2019? And can uh, verse 20 represent 2020? <sighs> and where would we put... Verse 19 and 20, as far as where they connect into these other verses. Okay, so. I, I know this gets a little bit tricky because of how, yeah. what I used here. But. Wouldn't 18 go with 11? Yeah. I am. Yep, yep, exactly. So this is, and I was. I mentioned this here. So you got verse 18 here because that's going to be the three messages arise, go, ask. And that's going to be the first angel's yeah. message. So we can take 18 catch. verse 11. Yeah. Very good catch. So and this, this is the point that I'm, we're, we're going to see here. So if we take 18, this first angel's message, right? Right. So when we look at 19, 20, 21, can we connect this all to our three dates? Right. November 9th, July 18th and December 21st, 20, 25th, 2021. But the angel of yes, it could work. I mean. Uh, I'm looking at verse 21, and yeah, that 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 could be uh, 187. Yeah. So again, we have he knew knew not that he was the, an angel of the Lord, right? So that's going to 21 is also going to connect with this idea. So 
21 is here as well, connecting with verse 6, doesn't know his name. So we have this angel of the Lord. We have um, verse 18, which is representing these three angels' messages. This is all representing 9-11. Now, do we connect 11-9 to 9-11? Yes. We do, right? So we know that 11-9 yeah. and 9-11 and are connected. Yeah. Now, yeah. now when we have... Uh, what happens in 2019, 20, and then 21, so these three different dates. I mean, we know we have these three dates in this 777 structure, but this becomes a specific um, repetition, let's say, of the three angels' messages to this movement. Like, we, we haven't done that yet. We haven't looked at that 777 structure and, and dealt with it as a line, the first, second, and third angels' message. You know, in a very specific way, we have it. We, we generally kind of looked at it that way. Um, but we can see that in this, this group of verses, and probably 18 to 21, is, um, you know, all about, well, and actually, if you look at 2022, Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. So is it 2022, does that represent 2022, verse 22? Does that, 1322, does that represent 2022? Does it represent what we've, what we've been seeing this year, specifically since uh, December 25th, 2021, in these studies? As this understanding of the lines, can we characterize it as a revelation of, of Christ, as the Mare, or is it the Mara? I can never remember which one people pronounce it as. <clears throat> the one that, 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 it's the mirror vision, right? The looking glass. And, and in a sense, we can take 18, 19, 20, 21, 20, 22, and then, uh, what, what is it about verse 20 that marks with the year 2020? Um, the acceptable, um, an acceptance of the offering, right? That's, uh, uh that was the 187. Uh, okay. it, it, what were we expecting? On July 18, 2020, we were expecting, we were expecting a big flame. Yeah, but it was a descent of a flame. Yeah. Okay. Right. We see the opposite. And and of course there was an altar there. Was it wasn't it this a temple? Yes, that was uh, uh, at, between the north and the south on the seventy, the Pantheon. Yeah. Pan the Parthenon. Yeah, yeah, it was the Parthenon, not the Pantheon. Parthenon. Yeah, the Parthenon, and and we had this this statue in there of um, what's her name? You got Nike, the small one, and um, she was what the goddess of wisdom. Um, I can't what think of her name. name. Athena. 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 So yeah, I, I wanted. To to add that Isaiah 6 5 goes with verse 22 also. Uh, Isaiah is crying, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Yeah. You know, so when we've when we wanted to have that looking glass vision, what what is it that we are expecting to see? Well, we were expecting a reflection uh, of the exact uh, exact reflection of it. We were expecting to say basically the same thing, but that's not what we've seen. Did I lose everybody? Sorry, there. Sharing the wrong thing here. I'm sorry. Did I lose everybody? What? No. 
You didn't, I'm just changing what you uh... No, that was my understanding. We were expecting to see a, an, a, basically an exact reflection. Okay, of what? In the looking glass vision, we have a revelation of Christ. And what were we expecting Christ to show us? Well, we were expecting to see these thing, these events happen. Show us ourselves. Yeah, that's what we've determined later, though. Okay. Well, yeah, but you know, we want to see who we are, right? right? I mean, this is this is what the gospel is about. Yeah, the looking glass, and we're all looking me, at something different. <laughs> yeah, to me, what people were looking for <laughs> is 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 they weren't looking for this. I mean, I mean, they would talk about it in a sense, but it was almost like, you know, when we have this vision, somehow we're going to be lifted up. We'll be a prophet of the Lord empowered. But we know that this is looking into the law. The law is a mirror, right? If any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Mm-hmm. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So when we, we, when we look at, um, when we don't listen to God, that is we're, we're at odds with God and we look into, um, it's like looking into a mirror. What do we see? We don't really see ourselves as we are. We justify ourselves. We say, I'm a pretty good guy. Right. Yeah. And, and we ignore the defects that we see. Right. Because we're not looking into the law of liberty. Right. We're not really looking into Christ's character. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, he who has that looking glass vision of Christ and continueth therein, that is, continues to look. Right. He not mm. being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed, right? So if we are going to right. see ourselves correctly and we are going to change, we need to behold Christ. Now here he's using the law. Now we, we've done this study before, but 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you know, Paul uses this, this same illustration and, and uses some of the same words. In verse 17, of chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, he says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, that is, we're looking at the law of liberty, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Now, so we know that in order to look into this to Christ, to see Christ, we're going to see ourselves as sinners. But if if we don't have that veil untaken away, that is, if the veil is there, we're blind. We can't really see our true spiritual condition. That's the Laodicean condition, right? Verse 14, but their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. So we're blind, we're in darkness, we can't see our true spiritual condition. And, and this message, this movement has been meant to show us our true spiritual condition, right? That's the purpose of this message. We believe so. Yeah, okay. So... So when we look at Judges chapter 13, we can see where the chiasm is. I mean, I don't know if it's a complete literary chiasm, but it is definitely a chiasm of concepts and ideas. A lack of a knowledge of God, and that we can tie some of the verses here symbolically to our dates. And we can say that verse 22, Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God, is what God has been showing us or should have been showing us. 
that this is this is the opportunity that we have. Now, in verse 23, because remember, we're saying that Judges goes from 21 to 23. And so verse 23 is going to represent 2023. But his wife said unto him, if the Lord were pleased to kill us, we would not have received a burnt offering. He would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us these things. What things did God show us? Did he receive a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands? And did he show us things? Nor would he, as at this time, have told us such things as these. I, I have to say that, yes, he has been showing us things, um, a lot of things. Because what is it that we have wanted to know? I mean, if we, we wanted to know God's character, we wanted to know what it is we need to do after July 18th. But we've known that all through our Christian experience. The reason we're Christians is we want to follow God. We want to do what he asks us to do. And it becomes, you know, our ideas at the beginning of what God wants and what ult ultimately ends up happening end up to diverge quite, quite a ways from each other, sometimes 180, mm. right? What we think that God's going to do to use us. <laughs> yes. So this is what has to be understood. I mean, if we're going to... If, we're, if we really are serious about being Seventh-day Adventists, about being Christians, about having this looking glass vision that, that has been talked about, uh, when all, all in reality, what that most of us have is we're, we have the story of James. We just look at in a mirror, we see our natural face. We don't see our true spiritual condition. We don't really know that we're far from God. Because we're just a hearer, but not a doer. But if we yoke up with Christ, we take up the law, the yoke, but it's yoked to Christ. We receive rest, right? Right. And, and that's what is wanting to be given to us, is this peace this assurance, in spite of ourselves, in spite of what we see, we can see God's hands and that he has accepted, in a sense, our offering, right? How, however, you know, which that offering that we're offering is, is of no value, really, right? Not to God, because it's just, it's just us, and yet it is valuable to him because it's what he wants, our hearts. But apart from him, they have no value. But God has demonstrated this to us because he's at this time shown us such things as these. Right? We've seen amazing things. Heidi and I were talking about this last night, um, just how much God has done in our lives personally and and we've had some very very difficult times i mean basically uh back in 2018 so you're looking at you know four years ago um you know my this this is actually four years ago today i believe that jeff wrote a letter to the elders saying that i should not be a teacher in the movement and two days after that, my dad died. And then, you know, on the Christmas Eve, we flew back to Canada, so to Alberta, for my dad's memorial service. And, um, and then we went back to the School of Prophets, flew back, and once we got there, within uh, five days, we were kicked out. And we had nothing. Like, we were worse than broke, you know. $30,000 in debt and, and nothing, you know. Um, and yet we trusted in God that he was going to take care of us. 
we weren't even worried because we saw God's hand in how he had led us. And, and if we just looked at the situation, we would have been very discouraged, but we weren't. You know, and, and, and we've always kept focused upon what God has done. And he's brought us a completely different situation four years later. And yet we're still faced with, you know, I'm being faced with probably losing my job. I expect to lose my job, but I might not. But I, I think, you know, if I was going to bet on it, I would say, you know, 90% likely that I'm not going to have a job in January. Um, but I'm not worried about it because God has been leading, right? He's the one that works it out, bro, not us. Yeah. So God's purposes are totally different than our purposes. But the problem that we've had in this movement is that we've looked at the things that are and, and we're judging by appearances, but not by righteous judgment. Right? That's why we can rejoice in tribulations and trials, because these are God's opportunities uh, to reveal his character to us, for us to depend upon him. If we really are serious about this looking glass vision, I mean... That looking glass vision doesn't happen at the height of Christian experience where everything is going wonderful. It happens at the depth of our experience in the val valley of the shadow of death. Correct? God's yeah. light shines on us when we're in darkness. So, I mean, however we're going to, to draw this on a line, I'm... Um, you know, I'm not sure that I, I can particularly know the best way to do it. Um, because I don't think we have a complete, you know, verse for verse chiasm, obviously. Um, but we do have this chiasm. And then it's going to have these last two verses, 24 and 25. Now, now I'm taking these as representing December 24th and December 25th. And I know it's probably not the best way to look at it, but, uh, but that's what I see that we're, we're coming to. So to deal with the end of 2023, which is where I believe that this, the line ends, that we see that there's this, this birth of Samson, right? Now, of course, the story of Samson is going to repeat and enlarge this history. So this preamble to Samson's birth, which is a zoom into 9-11 extends mm. all the way to 2023 as a line so in some ways we could take this judges chapter 13 and we could we could place it over as i did sort of in that that chiasm that it 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 leads to somewhere and it leads to 2023 but 2023 is connected with december 24th and december 25th of this year right because this movement has to be fulfilling its purpose when we come to the end of this. However, we, we see that. And we can see right now it's pretty discouraging. <laughs> yeah, but we don't we don't walk by sight. Okay. We don't walk by sight. We we walk by faith. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's every word of God. It's, it's not what we're thinking these things mean. I mean, because we've obviously can't do that. Um, yeah. It's been proven over and over again. But what we can do is, is, is just we see these things in the lines. We just know they're going to happen. We, right. we don't know yeah. how he's going to do it. You know, we may try to we might try to bring it about, but <laughs> it's not us. It's him. Yeah, because we visualize, at least I do, I visualize, you know, the future. I think about, okay, this happens, this could happen, and th right. this might happen in that way. Um, you know, I, I'm a planner. Uh, I'm a flexible planner, though. I'm, I'm mm. always willing to allow God to change my plans, which is pretty much 100% of the time. <laughs> um, but I still think about the future, right? If I go backpacking, I plan my trip quite well. Um you know, I, I know what to expect for the most most part. And uh, I always say if you have a good backpacking trip, when you get back, you you have 
uh, one meal left in your pack and you haven't used your first aid kit. That's a good backpacking trip. That's a good so, one. Yeah. But when it comes to, to, to planning with God, our plans can completely change. Right. Um, and I've had backpack trips like that too. So uh, where things don't quite go, where I'm begging food on the trail, which is um, always a fun thing. But, but the point is we make these plans, but God, he has these plans for us and, and to put ourselves into his hands. Um, that's really what the gospel is about. Now, this woman is going to bear a son and call his name Shimshon, right? So we, we said that the woman is the people in this movement, right? The, the church. And we know that this Samson means sunlight. Okay. Again, please. Samson means mean, sunlight. Sunlight? Sunlight. Okay. Right, so that, that's his name. Um, and means like the sun. You know, not the son of God, but like the sun in the sky. Um, you know, it comes from Shemesh. Shemesh means sun, right? Uh, so, which means brilliant. So... So here we have this, this sunlight that comes into the world. Now, this reminds me a bit of Ecclesiastes. And now Ecclesiastes has this theme that most people don't pick up on, but uh, he talks about everything under the sun, and he talks about uh, under heaven. What's the difference between everything under the sun, under the sun? What's the difference between under the sun and under heaven? In, uh, one is on earth, you know, between the earth and the sun. And the other is between like the center where God's throne is and all the rest of the universe. Okay. So, so when we look at the world under the sun, everything is meaningless, right? Purposeless, empty. Vanity, right? Right. So Solomon talks about under the sun all through the earth. And everything that's under the sun has no purpose or meaning. That is, what human sight can see, when we look at things by appearances, we don't see things as they really are. Right? Correct. We see Correct. Them as they appear. Yeah. But if we look at everything under heaven, there's a time to every purpose under heaven. Mm. All of the things that happen, the time to be born, the time to die, right, etc. We all know the song, but it's, you know, it's it's from Ecclesiastes. And, and so we can see that God has his purposes under his purview, under his sight, because he judges and sees things correctly as they really are. And we can see that in um, the study that uh, A.T. Jones did in 1893, he makes this quite clear that we don't see things correctly, that we don't understand ideas correctly. We don't understand God. We are completely ignorant. Without God, we have no knowledge. Because the only thing that matters, the only knowledge that matters is the knowledge of God, of his character. And that the mind of man, the natural mind, the mind of the flesh, it just produces, even if it desires to do good, it can't do it because it can't see and understand good. But the mind of the spirit, the mind of Christ, is what is needed in order to produce righteousness. It is a it comparison. Yeah, right? cause, yeah, because if I'm going to see things, I have to see them as God sees them. I have Correct. to look at people around me as God sees them. Because from natural sight, we look at people and we see their flaws. We see their defects of character. Of course, we don't see our own. But we see other people's defects of character quite readily. And we compare ourselves with them. 
and we say, well, we're better than they are. And, and we are actually aren't, uh, because what we're doing is actually the, a satanic mind, right? In how we look at others. We're doing the exact work of Satan in judging our brothers. So by doing that, we're, we're actually showing uh, the depth of human depravity when we judge our brother. Right? That's, That's what scriptures tells us. Satanic depravity, really. And, and that's because we don't see things as God sees things. We don't see that person as a valuable soul. We don't do anything to redeem them. We actually pick up stones and cast them at that person. We do the work of the adversary. And yet we call ourselves Christians. That's us, right? Not somebody else. That's us. That's what we are. But if we have the mind of Christ, we see that person as a hurting, valuable soul, somebody that needs to be redeemed, and not in some sort of, um, you know, arrogant fashion that we're better than them and, you know, sort of condescendingly. Um, we actually have to take up our cross. We're and, supposed to protect those people. Yeah, we have to we have to manifest Christ's character. We have to we have to, in a sense, take that harm that is being placed upon that other person and put it upon ourselves. That's right. You know, um, well, here's an example from my own personal life. So take it with it what you what you will. But um, when when I was a kid in elementary school. So it would have been probably, I think, grade four. So it's pretty young. Um, I was sort of the big brother to a lot of the little kids. I was the, the schoolyard protector. Because um, one is I was, I was a little bit bigger than a lot of other kids, um, both in height and girth. And, uh, and, and I, I guess I must have been intimidating in some ways to some of the bigger kids. But um, so a lot of the little kids, kids they sort of looked at, it was grade five actually uh, I remember it um and uh and so I, I never you know I, I don't know particularly I didn't get in a bunch of fights or anything I only once did and um and that's where uh all of the the bullies got together and decided that I needed to be dealt with because I was um uh, hindering their bullying of these younger kids and so so we had a fight and uh, we got my, we were supposed to get all the people on my side together against the people on the other side. And it ended up just me <laughs> in the place of all the people that I had been protecting. None of them showed up against this group of guys. And uh, we ended up fighting for about four blocks all the way to my back alley. Um, I finally got hit right in the nose and my nose started bleeding. And that was the end of the fight. But uh, um but in some ways, you know, you look at this situation, Christ is our protector. And, you know, we, we, we can't fight for ourselves. These accusations, these, these darts that come from the enemy, you need somebody to intercede on our behalf, right? This is the whole thing about what Jones is talking about with the state. Does the state have all the power in the world? I'm sorry. Does the state does the state have all the power in the world? No, they just have their power in their hands. The power well, that's they, in their hands. They have all the power in the world, right? So well, if we're in the world, do we have anything that can protect us from the power of the state? Not in the world. Right, not in the world, right? So where do we have to be? In Christ, right? If we're in Christ which is in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, can the world have any power over us? No. So should we have any fear of what the world might do to us? No, we shouldn't. Should we, should we have any fear that the state knows our identity, knows our names? Um, that None there's of that stuff. Information against us. No, we shouldn't have any fear about any of these things, Right. Because God knows all these things, and we're not in the world, are we? 
No. If we're in Christ. We're in his kingdom already. We just are amb ambassadors here. And if we're ambassadors, that means that heaven is placed here on earth to protect us, right? Remember what happens with an embassy. If you have an embassy yeah. in another country, that if you're in that embassy, you're protected. You're in your own country. That's right. So as ambassadors in Christ, Christ is our embassy. We're in Christ. Are we in danger while we're in Christ? Um, you have to define danger. I mean, because oh, even no. death is in danger to right. the, the true exactly. Christian. Right. Exactly. Anything that can come at us, um, we're protected from because we're That's in Christ. Right. No matter if if they take our lives or not, because yeah. they're not taking our lives, they're just ending this time period for us. Yeah, so when the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol, this is Samson. Um, so we know that even though Samson has all these ne negative characteristics that represent our human nature, God is still using Samson. Right? Right. He is sunlight to the world. Right? He's, and, and we can be the light of the world. Now, what we often expect that we need, I, I, I have to mute you in between, Ron. You make a lot of noise, but um, so just try to use your space bar when you talk and then let go of it. Um, so, you know, when we look at, um, how God is going to use us. So what we often imagine is that we're going to become these great, wonderful, perfect Christians in our own eyes, right? Um, and that God is going to use us in this sort of big way, right? Where this attention is drawn to us and, and you know, where these powerful Christians, some kind of warriors. But really where the battle is fought is in very small little places. It's in our interactions with individuals right we've talked about this before so we often look for this big work you know that somehow we have this huge ministry it would be like doug bachelor you know or something where you got this huge ministry amazing facts and you do all this work and you know but the work that god's asking us to do is bigger than that because it's on a level with the individual it's like jesus talking to Nicodemus, or the woman at the well, or his disciples, right? Those are the most powerful um, sermons that Christ could represent, represent the gospel in those sermons. You know, you must be born again, right, to Nicodemus. You know, I am... Uh, I can give you living water to the woman at the well. So, so God is asking uh, of us something that I, I think that we, we hardly understand. He's asking us to take up our cross daily. And we don't really know what that means, Right. We have this idea, obviously, you know, I got to do things I don't like doing, this sort of the idea that are painful. But when we take up our cross, it's not, it's not just for us. It's not our experience that becomes the focus. It's what, it's, it's those that Christ died for that's the focus. So, you know, I, I don't know. Here, let's uh, let's go to these uh, diagrams and try to see what we can do. So we had started with these, um, you know, putting this on a line, and 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 I don't know if this is basically, you know, that we we have to rewrite all of this completely. But I'll share the screen.
Okay, so that's not working. There we go. No, it's not, not the right one. I don't know why. Oh, I see it in the wrong place. Sorry about that. Um, I hate this OneDrive thing because I always get things saved wrong. So this should be the right one. No, nope, this is not the right one either. Okay, let's see. Maybe I was just looking at the wrong place on here. <clears throat> well, I don't see it, so I don't know where it is. Maybe I need to recover something. How do I do file recovery? Iran? What do I do? Because at some reason, uh, my computer had shut off and whatever I'd drawn was gone. Maybe I just start over again. Uh, usually it has a list, but I'm not remembering offhand. Okay, how I bring up this list. Yeah, because I don't see... Uh, see this I, I've done that same thing and um, I, when I power up the the application uh, it usually will have it on the side on the left side yeah, I've got I the know. most current um, Windows applications yeah so it doesn't do that when I do this oops So anyway, we had this line drawn out, which I don't have anymore. <laughs> um, I know it, it exists because I didn't delete that, that backup. So there must be a way. Of... OK, well, I might have to draw the new line again. Is that the one that we had, uh, we were doing on, I think it was Friday? Well, it wasn't a Friday, but it was, um, yeah. Could have been Thursday. I do recall you working on the lines on the last couple of presentations. I'm looking. Okay, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to have to do this on the whiteboard or something. Okay, so let's uh, let's do it this way. Okay, I guess we're going to stop there, and uh, we'll pick this up. I didn't realize the time. So we'll pick this up then uh, tomorrow, and let's close with a word of prayer. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we just ask for your spirit uh, to continue to be with us. Help us as we um, um, study this on our own. We pray for each person. And Continue to work in our lives, we ask and pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care, everyone. God bless.